Hello, I'm Pastor John Rudolph from the North Carroll Cooperative Parish, and we are thankful that you have joined us for another week of online worship. Uh, this weekend's worship is June the 21st, 2020. 20 years ago this week, Pastor Melissa and I were on our honeymoon, and our first stop was Disney World. And uh, it was my first time. It was uh, I had never been there. I had not traveled much, period. And, and Pastor Melissa was very excited to show me something new. Um, while we were there, we made our way into an attraction one evening. And as we were sitting in the stands, uh, the MC came out and was giving some instruction and welcoming everybody, getting everybody kind of hyped, and, and asked the question, is anybody here on their honeymoon? And when he said that, I shouted and I hooted and I hollered as loud as I could. Uh, and, and certainly, to no surprise, uh, we got their attention. And uh, before we knew it, we were whisked backstage. And uh, costume and makeup folks were right there and getting us ready to be part of the show. Um, and so, um, I, you know, I don't know what I said exactly, but maybe I said, now what? Um, and uh, certainly, uh, we were on a new adventure. Uh, ironically, uh, as this time's out, uh, that attraction was the Indiana Jones attraction. And so we were there, part of the cast, searching for uh, God's Ark, the Jewish people's manifestation of God that began in the wilderness and took them uh, on their adventures through the wilderness and now as they prepare to go into the uh, promised land. The ark is at the center, literally and uh, spiritually, in our passage today as we continue to look at Joshua, the first few chapters in this series, Now What? Spiritually, the ark was the manifestation of God's presence. And in, in Exodus, God spoke to Moses and um, instructed him to have this ark built um, and then as the people um, would get up and prepare to move, uh, practically, God used the ark um, as an indicator when it was time to, to get up and go and when it was time to stop. Uh, the ark always went out in front of the people and uh, by a pillar of smoke and by fire, fire, it would lead the way so people would not get lost as they journeyed from one place to another. Uh, according to, to, to some midrash, midrash is is um, extra biblical material that's passed down from one generation to another by, and captured and, and prepared uh, by rabbis. But according to one of these Midrash reports, um, what the ark would do and the reason you would leave some space, um, and some specific space between you and the ark, was that actual flames would shoot out from underneath and literally clear a path. And so the flames would kill snakes and scorpions and shrubbery, and, uh, and in its wake would be a clear path for the people to, to, to walk. Um, I wouldn't have any problem staying at the back of the group um, if that was happening, especially um, snakes and scorpions. Uh, but the ark would take care of that. The ark uh, accompanied them all throughout um, their wandering in the desert and into the promised land. Uh, as we're going to read next week, we'll find out that the ark was um, one of the most dramatic scenes in, in Joshua is where uh, the people are marching around the city of Jericho and, and just the presence of the ark circling those walls. The, all, the walls come tumbling down uh, when the trumpets are, are blared. So the ark was extremely powerful uh, presence of God and there were all kinds of rules about who could uh, carry it and, and you certainly couldn't touch it or you would die. And so there's some, just some great, great stories about the ark. In fact, uh, in one of the battles later on, you know, past uh, the stories that we're dealing with in this passage, um, the Philistines capture the ark. Um, and it doesn't take long for the Philistines to decide, we got to get this back to the Israelites. So much so that they pay the Israelites to take it back because all these terrible things were happening to the Philistines. Uh, and then when the oxen that were carrying or, or pulling the ark back to, to the Israelites uh, when they got it back into the hands of the Israelites, um, another midrash, another legend is uh, that the oxen burst out into song. Uh, so the so the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of God's people, you know, just very, very much a part of this biblical narrative 
and legend and lore um, in spiritual ways and in secular ways like we mentioned Indiana Jones and his series of, of movies that deal with the ark. Uh, the ark remained in the temple until its destruction at the hand of the Babylonians and to this day um, we just simply really don't know what happened to the ark after that moment. Um, and so with all that, now what? You know, what does that have to do with anything uh, that we're, we're, we're talking about? Well, it has everything to do with what we're talking about and what, what we were reading about in chapter 3 here. It's the, uh, the pivotal tool that's going to be used to cross the Jordan River. And so as the people of God are gathered there, uh, Joshua has gotten word from God that this is the time. It's now. Now is when we're going to move into the land. And, and so um, instructions are given to the leaders to, to tell the people, hey, when you see uh, the, the Levite priest uh, gather the ark and raise it up and start to head out, uh, you know it's time now that we're going to go through uh, the Jordan. And in fact, the ark's going to stop right in the middle of the river, and um, the priests are going to have their feet on dry land as the water is going to open up and the people are going to be able to go through. Um, and so this is it. This is the movement. This is the moment where God's people are living into this dream for the very first time. The obstacle, the first obstacle of the river has been eliminated by the power of God in the presence of this, of this ark we call the Ark of the Covenant. It wasn't an easy task. This is the people of God that have been wandering for 40 years and from, from multiple generations had heard about this promise. It wasn't long ago for the same group of people um, who were trying to uh, wander around the desert waiting for this day uh, that they were, they were so tired of this new adventure, so scared of what was going to come next that they actually begged Moses to go back to Egypt. They wanted to go back into slavery because at least there they knew um, what to expect. And so um, this fear of new is, is really where I want to focus on today because you can imagine as they cross through the river, um, it's not just that the water is going to come tumbling down, that's the obstacle. That obstacle has been eliminated. But now they have a brand new obstacle, and that is fear of the unknown, fear of a new adventure. You know, it's actually, there's a phobia for fear, fearing something new. It's called, and it's an easy one to remember, neophobia. And so sometimes neophobia can become the most devastating, most difficult obstacle for you and I to overcome when we're trying to live out a dream or a vision. And again, it almost happened to the people of God in the wilderness before they even got to this point. Um, but neophobia, the fear of new adventures, um, it harms us and prevents us from having fulfilling relationships, from fulfilling marriages. Um, we, we can get into to ruts in relationships that, that keep us from trying something new. Uh, and we all know what can happen uh, with those adventures when, when we stop trying to do new things with one another. It happens in work and our employment and our careers where we just get so comfortable that we don't want to try anything new. Um, and then so we were stale or we regress in our productivity. It happens in our play and our hobbies in, in the same way. It even and especially happens in our faith life and in our church life. We just get so, you know, it's been so long ago since you and I maybe you know, have committed ourselves to God through Christ. And we were so enthusiastic and so excited and we wanted to grow in our faith in, in, in any ways, in amazing ways. And then that too, just like our other relationships, we can get into a pattern to where we are stale or we regress um, in, in, in terms of not trying things new. Um, and in, in church life, especially church leadership, like me and Pastor Melissa and, and lay leaders in churches all around the world, a lot of times um, maybe you've heard the famous last words or the seven dying words of a church. And that's where we hear leaders say, and we've all done it before, we have never done it that way. That's seven deadly words. We have never done it that way. And really what that is is the fear of trying something new. 
Um, and so that's an obstacle to us living into the dreams and visions that God has given us in relationships, in work and play, and even in our faith and church life. And here's the problem. The problem is it's a matter of life and death. Living into something new, going forward in an adventure, in a dream or a vision that God has given us is life-giving um, in, in all those areas that we just talked about. Um, and it's interesting how the brain works for you and I, uh, for human beings. There is this natural chemical that's, that's in our brain. It's called dopamine. And dopamine is released when we do something new and adventurous or maybe even conquer a fear. And so if we're like the Israelites, we're afraid to go into a new land, but we do it anyway. All kinds of dopamine is going to be released. It's to feel good. It helps us to feel good. And not just about uh, feel good about ourselves, but it re-energizes us and gets us excited about doing something else. Um, and then what really happens is that when we don't do things adventurous things or we don't experience new things that dopamine actually decreases in our brains and then what happens is it's a vicious cycle and so next time a new adventure or an obstacle in our dreams or visions uh, presents itself we're even less likely to take a risk in doing something new and then more dopamine uh, decreases and you can see how that cycle would continue and so we need to, for our own body, our own soul, our own brain, to be willing to take some risk when we're chasing a God-sized dream or vision. And so um, that's where we find ourselves here in the middle of this river as we're walking through. The people of God are saying, yes, we're going to go through. Um, and they're not, you know, the fear is real. Joshua even knows it. God knows it. And here's what God, here's the antidote to that. If, if you feel like you're in a place where... Uh, you're chasing a dream or a vision, and you do experience this obstacle of the fear of doing something new and adventurous, take these words that God gave Joshua to give to the people. He says, Joshua says, um, or God tells Joshua, command the people, as soon as you see the Lord your God's ark and the Levitical priest carrying it, you are to march out from your places and follow it. But let there be some distance, remember those flames, let there be some distance between you and it, about 3,000 feet. Don't come near it. And here's the word. Here's the word for you and I. You will know the way you should go, even though you've never traveled this way before. Man, that's awesome. So Joshua knew, and, and you know, God knew and told Joshua to, to give this word to the people because they hadn't been there before. And so what the people had to get to the point of, of knowing is that, you know, on this part of the journey, well, all parts of the journey, but especially crossing this water, just look straight ahead and just trust and go. You know, God had performed the miracle here. The waters had spread. So now all they had to do is, is walk through it and trust God would lead the way um, and, you know, to the other side. And a lot of times that's easier said than done because you and I want to be in control of everything. But somewhere along the line in, in your chasing of your own dreams that God's placed on your heart, you're going to have to simply trust that God is still a God of miracles. And you're going to have to believe that where you don't see a path, one is being cleared for you by God. And again, this is for all areas of our life. If your dream is, is for a, a loving and caring, long-lasting, romantic relationship, if it's a dream that be, uh, be in union with your, your whole family, your cousins, your mothers, your fathers, whatever, whatever the dream is in terms of relationships, there's times when you have to leave it to God and trust that God's going to make a way in work and play the same way. In our faith life, in our church life, there are times where we just say, I don't know which way we're going to go, but I'm going to go because God's leaving the way. God's a God of miracles and God will, will clear the path. Um, and, and so that's how we go after adventures. And, and so we take this word from Joshua today. You will know the way you should go, even though you've never traveled this way before. That Indiana Jones exhibit in Disney World uh, 20 years ago for Pastor Melissa. Now, that was our first adventure as a married couple, and it certainly wasn't the last. Uh, we have always been willing to go where we don't really see a way, uh, but we've always been willing to trust that God was 
in control of our journey. And certainly there have been obstacles in our marriage like everybody else, you know, financially, uh, financial issues and obstacles, um, you know, other ordinary relationships, up, ups and downs, seasons of being exhausted, moving from one place to another, having one kid and then another and then another and another and another and another. Uh, you know, all those things create obstacles, but all of them were adventures as well. And each time we, we went through to a new place, uh, the dopamine was released in our brains and our spirit grew in terms of our relationship with God and Christ. And we were that more ready to, to tackle the next obstacle. Um, and so that's my prayer uh, for you as well, that you're willing to say yes to God um, in the area of life where your dream rests and, and be able to, to go someplace you haven't traveled before so that you have to trust God. And in that, God will lead the way. You'll grow in your faith. You'll feel good, uh, naturally and, and supernaturally good. And you'll be ready and able to, to pursue your dream for another day. And so I ask God to be with you as you contemplate these scriptures. I'm thankful for this word today. I look forward to seeing you uh, next week online as we continue the story of God's people in this new adventure in a new land, trusting and following God 